Oh hey there gang, you ready to do a neck reset? I think I am. I have to psych myself up for these. Uh, the patient today is a Martin guitar. I think the owner said 1983, but looking at the serial number there, I believe that's a 1985. And also it's got a truss rod in it, which would definitely suggest 85. This is a D16M, and really, I think the only thing that differentiates it from a D18 in this period is that it's got no back binding on it, which is kind of funny to see in a guitar of this vintage. So, solid mahogany back and sides, Sitka spruce top, um, just a good old workhorse of a Martin guitar, and it definitely needs a little bit of work on it. To start with, there's some pretty significant fret wear down in the lower positions here. That B string in particular has basically eaten through at the second and third fret. It's almost down to the board, um, but also the first string up to, I think, probably the fifth or sixth fret. So these are going to have to go. We're going to do a partial refret on this. As is often the case, the binding has started to separate a little bit from the tightest portion of the waist in here. So we're going to try and re-glue that if possible. That can be tricky sometimes if it's shrunk a lot. The action's pretty stiff. The owner says it was always on the harder side to play, but it's gotten progressively worse over the years. And there's virtually no saddle on this guitar. Now here's the really interesting thing. He said he bought this new... It has never according to him, ever had any work done on this saddle. And if this is a factory setup, I'm really surprised, because it's super low. So the saddle height, the exposure above the top of the bridge, varies between 1 32nd and 3 64ths of an inch, which is exceptionally low. And the actual height of the strings above the soundboard is riding at about an even 3 eighths of an inch. It's around 10 millimeters, which again, that's pretty low for a dreadnought guitar. If this is a factory setup, not what I would expect. Um, there's not much of a belly back here. I mean, there's a moderate, just a little bit, which you would expect to find in a 35-year-old guitar. If there wasn't one, you would suspect that it was probably overbuilt. So the action height at the 12th fret um, is 7 and a half 64ths, down to about 5 and a half on the treble side. Um, that's getting up there. To my mind, 8 64ths or 1 8th of an inch is pretty much the tallest I would ever want it to be. He's thinking that it's playing tough for him, and of course with that extremely low saddle, you know, it is time for a neck reset. It's a Martin guitar, 35 years. It's pretty much, it's following the schedule. In terms of neck relief, we've got about 10 thousandths of an inch at the 6th uh, fret, which is a bit more than Martin's factory spec, but it's not outrageous. That's okay, 10 thousandths. The height of the strings over the first fret seems to be okay, although we might be getting away with that due to the deep grooves in that first fret, so it's possible that when we put the new frets on we'll have to make a new nut as well. This has one of those bridge plate saver devices installed. Unfortunately, you see it was misaligned. Uh, one of the holes didn't get covered, so I'll see if I can take that off and reposition it. Having a look around in here as well for any structural issues, I don't see any. Um, by this time of the 80s, Martin, well, like a lot of things in the music industry, had stepped back from some of the excesses of the late 1970s. Um, they were getting really out of hand with their brace sizes. Uh, they just got bigger and bigger, and um, in this case, it's quite lightly braced actually, and tone bars are quite deeply scalloped. Okay, with a straight edge on top of the frets here, and you kind of have to be careful how you do this because in this case there's quite a lot of fall away on the fingerboard extension so it, it rocks pretty significantly on the 14th or 15th fret there but making sure it sits on the back side of that we'll project this forward and see where it contacts the front edge of the bridge and as we expected it's below the top of the bridge in a perfect situation this ruler would be sitting at or just maybe slightly above the top of the bridge, but in this case we're low. And uh, that is at about eh, just around 7 30 seconds of an inch, just below a quarter of an inch, which is low. Um, not as low as some I've seen in, in worst case scenarios. You've got them way down here and you have to take a whole lot off the heel to make the neck sit right. But in this case we're going to do a bit of a shave on the back end of the heel 
so that we can both improve the action and also raise this saddle and give us a slightly better brake angle. I'm going to start to heat up and loosen the fingerboard extension here in a second, but before I do that I want to use the neck reset formula to figure out how much material I'm going to need to remove from the end of the heel to kick the neck back and give us the proper action. So in order to do that we need to figure out how much material we'd remove from the saddle to give us the proper action. Remember, if we want to lower the action at the 12th fret by a certain increment, we need to take twice that amount of material off the saddle. In this case, it would have to come down by 5 64ths of an inch. Physically impossible in this bridge, but that's what it needs. In addition, we don't want to end up with a saddle that's exactly the same height. Uh, we want to raise it because this is way too low. And I'm going to add 3 64ths of an inch, which is basically going to double the saddle height and get us much more in line with what we would expect to see on this kind of guitar. So, you know, 5 64ths plus 3 64ths that's 125 thousandths of an inch. We take that number and we multiply it by the length of the heel. In this case, 3.75 inches. Having done that, we then divide it by the length between the body fret, in this case the 14th, and the center of the saddle. In this case, 11.5 inches. So having divided that, we end up with the increment which is 40 thousandths of an inch about one millimeter worth of material has to come off on the end of the heel describing a wedge that fades away to nothing up here at the soundboard surface. And as usual I've taken out a stack of feeler gauges here equal to forty thousandths and holding those up against the end of the body Martins are nice like this because it's almost a perfect ninety degree angle there they sit very nice against the end of the body and I'll just make a little score line there So that'll get me in the ballpark. I'm starting to heat up the fingerboard extension. For those of you who are going to ask, this is called a sealing iron, as if you were to seal something in a bag. It's used in a number of different crafts. If you do a search online, you can find them. They're pretty reasonably priced. I'm drilling a couple of skinny holes to reach the front of the neck pocket, which is just in front of the 15th fret on a Martin because I'll be using Ian Davlin's resistance heater setup again for this guitar. This is the third reset I've used it for. Quite happy with that setup. Here's the heart of the system. A couple of stainless steel tubes with some insulated nichrome wire. This is the first time I'm trying this out on a guitar put together with modern aliphatic glues. Previous ones were hide glue, they came apart with no problem. I actually happened to be talking to Ian while I was setting this up here. Um, we were discussing which one of us should have our face photoshopped onto the little guy that comes in riding on top of Master Blaster in the uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome movie. And he said you probably don't even need the water in this case, just the heat alone, but you'll need pressure so you'll have to put it in the jig that pops the neck free. You can't wiggle these ones out by hand because that white glue is just so obstinate. So I stopped and put it in the jig. About a minute later I was moving the camera when I heard this sound. So I immediately dropped the camera and grabbed hold of the guitar because the glue that Martin is using at this point, when it heats up, it acts almost like an elastic band or a slingshot. Uh, there's a lot of potential energy and it, when it lets go, it can actually pop free with some violence, which is not a good thing with these guitars as we're about to see because the first edition Martin truss rod has some strange geometry to it. And if you don't know that, you've got to realize that it's not going to slide out of there easily. You've got to do some careful wiggling. Here's a quick and dirty diagram. This is the neck, this is the heel, this is the dovetail tenon, this is the truss rod, and this is the fingerboard, seen in profile. Similarly, this is the neck block. It's the neck block proper. There's an extension that moves forward underneath the soundboard. This is the large transverse brace, the one that's right above the sound hole. There is a pocket cut for the dovetail, and also one that goes forward across the uh, extension here in the center that will house the truss rod. So the other thing is this little brown line here, this is actually soundboard wood. They covered over part of the pocket with the soundboard. And this is something that you have to keep in mind. Because in practice, when this thing is together, that soundboard wood is actually sandwiched in between the truss rod 
and the fingerboard. So when it comes time to remove this, you can't be levering back and forth. There isn't clearance. You'll be breaking that soundboard material. The other thing is when it comes time after you've done your neck reset, you've reduced the heel. That makes the dovetail tenon loose in its pocket and we have to shim it out, either putting shims in the pocket itself or building out what we call the cheeks or the sides of the dovetail, uh, gluing shims onto those. Uh, then we can sneak up to a perfect fit where things lock in place. When it comes time to do that, there really isn't, if you overbuild it any, there is not enough room to get that truss rod underneath there, the fingerboard on top, and tip it down into place. You'd end up breaking the wood again. You can't lift this high enough. So you're basically forced to cut back some of this soundboard material here over top of that channel. And that way you can get in there, get the truss rod through that front brace, and then tip it down and have it come into position where it has to stay. Why did Martin do it this way? I don't know. Um, this is an early thing. I think by the time, I'm trying to remember, the 1994 one I did, I don't think this was an issue. I believe they changed the design and removed more material at that point. Uh, but it's just something you really do have to keep in mind. Of course, guitars previous to 1985, it's not an issue at all because the, the neck reinforcement doesn't extend forward into the body at that point. They just pop right out. So this is something that you have to be wary of when you're doing sort of the early truss rotted Martins. I'm not sure how they did this in the factory. Maybe they had tooling that was accurate enough to get within a couple of thousandths of a perfect fit. Um, so they just had to rub a sanding block over it a couple of times to drop the dovetail in and get it to bottom, you know, lock in perfectly. Maybe they did the preliminary fitting before they put the fingerboard on. Oh, the other thing is oftentimes this little tongue of top wood here, it's, it, there's nothing supporting it down the center of the soundboard, so it often cracks and splits. And um, when that happens, I usually glue on a thin cross grain cleat um, in front of that transverse brace there. It's about a millimeter thick, so it, it doesn't interfere with the operation of the truss rod. Uh, but it will give it a little bit more support. I think the youngest Martin I've done a neck reset on would have been 1994, and the earliest was from the 1920s. I don't know what Martin is using for glue these days. The bridge re-glues that I've been doing recently respond nice to heat, but in the 80s and 90s they were using a white glue that gets really, really sticky when it heats up. Uh, it's like a high-quality mozzarella on a nice slice of New York-style pizza pie. It's gooey. So, I have to clean out the mortise and the soundboard surface and then slightly hollow out or undercut the inside faces of the neck here. And I can do my sandpaper pulling and correct the angle. I'm going to use a wide chisel to carefully pare this stuff away from the inside of the pocket. The glue immediately dulls your chisel, which is kind of a shame because you need it sharp to cut the end grain when you're doing the clearance cuts around the heel like this. We'll do some sandpaper pulls here. This is 120 grit paper with some packing tape on the back to make it hold together better. And between each pull, I think it's a good idea to brush away all of the dust, which can have abrasive particles in it, which could get sandwiched between the paper and the side, causing scratches. This took about 35 pulls on either side. And I was checking progress frequently with a straight edge to make sure that things were going according to plan. I cut a piece of rosewood to make a wedge for underneath the fingerboard extension. I scraped, marked it with a pencil so I could check my progress, and sanded that to shape. The wedge needs a clearance cut for the truss rod. We'll glue that in place and trim it to fit. I'll wet sand the joint between the two pieces with some super glue to both fill the pores on the wedge and kind of blend the two together. 
with a shim in the pocket of the approximate right size. You can see here's the clearance issue I was talking about. So I'm going to go ahead and cut back the soundboard to about the start of those rosette rings to give me enough room to tip the truss rod down into the pocket. Got a couple of pieces of mahogany veneer here which I'm going to glue to the cheeks of the tenon. And I'll press those in place with a couple of carefully shaped clamping blocks that uh, have both the included angles required to um, give me something to hold on to with a clamp. I'm going to chalk fit this joint. Carbon paper works well on light colored woods. I think the chalk shows up better on this dark mahogany. When I press the neck home, some of the chalk is transferred to the tight parts on the tenon. Then I can scrape away those chalk modeled areas. This is not unlike the technique used for flattening the ways in precision machinery. If you do it carefully, the tapers meet perfectly and you don't need glue to lift it up. Still, it is a good idea to put some glue in there. I'm having a hard time taking this saddle out. It's so low, there's nothing to grip. Get that popped out with a tiny little chisel on the end. I'll measure the dimensions of the slot and I'll go ahead and make a new bone saddle. I'm going to replace those first five frets, heat them up with a soldering iron, pull those out. Rosewood boards seem to be the most forgiving when it comes to fret extraction. I'll give the board a light cleanup with a radius sanding block. There are some pretty deep grooves in around the first and second frets. I think it might be time to fill those. I want to clean these very well to get rid of any grease or grunge that's down in there. And I fill with multiple coats of rosewood dust and super glue until there's a buildup over top of the surface. I come back and level using a single edge razor blade and sand to blend it in with the rest of the board. I'm not aiming to make it smooth as glass. I'm just going to get rid of the most egregious stuff. I'll clean out the fret slots and make sure they're accurately sized. I'll get some glue down in the slots. I haven't done any fret dressing yet. Just strung it up for a little while to see what it would do. Um, after rough guesstimation of the saddle height being just a bit generous, uh, so there'd be some room to play around with. I think it was pretty bang on because I got an action of six and a half on the base, five sixty-fourths on the treble. So it just takes a little bit more to really dial it in. I was interested in what might happen with the nut here, figuring that the slots had probably worn in at the same rate as those frets, but despite the heavy play and the deep grooves in those first few frets here, the nut slots are actually still fine. And in fact, the B-string is really quite tall, um, enough that I can feel it being too high. So that probably contributed to the feeling of it being difficult to play all those years. And it won't need a new nut after all, you know, sometimes you get lucky. These new frets begin life at around 39 thousandths of an inch in height bang on, but the original ones up the neck weren't very much lower. I think they were around 34, 35. That one's actually 36, so we could almost get away with not doing any leveling at all, but I think we should just to tie everything in together nicely and make it play as well as it possibly can. Don't you agree? I thought you might. And while well, this 15th fret here, the replaced one, is bound to require some dressing, it's going to rock up there. So I'll put it in the neck jig. I use a bone saw in order to cut the skull off in order to be able to access the brain. Uh, usually that's very Just going to recrown these a little bit with a three corner file. We'll round over the fret ends. I'm going to have to make some custom clamping calls in order to put this loose binding back into place. Sometimes a little bit of heat applied very judiciously can soften the binding enough that it will stretch back to where it was. I'll quickly get some glue in there, wipe off as much as possible, and then clamp it in place. So that sat down pretty good. The longer they're open, the more difficult it can be to stretch them back into place. 
take some effort to get one of these bridge pad savers off because the adhesive they use is pretty strong. Came out pretty good. It needs a little bit of straightening before it goes back in. I have to sand off the remnants of the adhesive and clean it really well before it's ready for reinstallation. I'm going to use some very strong and thin double sided tape to hold this in place. First I need to cut out the string holes. People always ask about this knife handle. This is a Veritas Carver's knife available through Lee Valley. What I think it was was a surgeon came to Mr. Lee at some point and asked if he could um, develop a custom scalpel holder that was more like an X-Acto knife holder but long and quite heavy. It's uh, machined aluminum and brass so it's heavier than you might think it would be. Uh, very positive to hold and it fits my hand well so I've been using it for years. I'm not sponsored by Lee Valley but I do have a lot of their tools because I used to work for them. I'm using pins in the outside holes to help as a positioning device and sighting down through the bridge to make sure everything lines up. I'll also apply pressure using a bridge clamp to make sure the adhesive gets a good solid hold. Okay, it's all back together. We'll take it for a test run here in a second. Actually, I got video yesterday of me playing it before I put the plate mate back in there. So we can do it again and have a side-by-side -side comparison and see if there's any real audible difference with it in there. Uh, I don't hear much myself, so if there is an effect, it's got to be pretty subtle. It just sounds like a really good Mahogany Martin guitar, you know, it's kind of hard to beat. And I'm very happy with the way it turned out. Thanks for watching, guys. Take it easy, and remember, if it ain't broke, don't break it. Mm -hmm.